listening to a learning resource created for Minnesota geography students and their teachers by the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. We are a group of volunteers whose mission is to help you understand your world better through geography. Our story here illustrates selected long-term changes in small rural towns and the changes in agriculture practices on the farms which surround them. Our focus is on what changed and what some of the causes of those changes have been. Several Minnesota geography standards are addressed by this podcast. Dr. David Lanergren is the director of the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education and a professor of geography at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm Fred Kunze, a retired teacher and a member of the MAGE Steering Committee and producer of MAGE Podcasts. In the introductory podcast, we've already learned that Montevideo is a small Midwestern farm community in southwestern Minnesota. We looked at the site and situation of Montevideo, discovering that it sits on a bluff overlooking two rivers, the Chippewa and the Minnesota. We learned that it's a long-time railroad town coming out of the 1800s, and that from its start, it was a fairly rapidly growing town. Old photographs show a bustling main street with numerous and varied businesses over many years. But since the late 1950s, the population has remained virtually the same. Children of farmers as well as town people largely left Montevideo for other places. The once dominating rail industry slowly died out and changed in nature. The jobs went away. Different jobs came in. The types of businesses on Main Street began to change. What caused these changes? Listen carefully to residents as they describe changes they have witnessed. First, we'll hear from Arnie Knuckleby. Arnie lived on a farm for 85 years of his life. As Mr. Knuckleby talks about his childhood and later experiences on earlier farm life, the student should listen and take notes about what kind of energy and manpower it took to farm back then. What kind of tools did they use? What kind of implements? How much could they farm in a day? What would go on in the farmhouse after the people got off the fields? Take notes on that so you'll be able to compare that to descriptions of modern farm changes in another later podcast. So uh, when when you were on the farm, did you have duties as a young boy? Things you I had started to do? milking cows when I was five years old. And you, you milk cows by hand when you were five years old? I had one cow old. that I milked because it was an easy one to milk. So, and my brothers were, I think, anxious to get me into the workforce. <laughs> you know, they were older. And... Yeah. and um, we milk cows every day, every night. How many cows did your family have? Oh, I suppose it had stalls for eight. So did they have expectations for you for other jobs on the farm? Typical day, did you, were you assigned jobs, or were you just a kid except for the milking well, of the cow? We would feed the pigs and, and pick eggs. We had a hen house. I remember going in the hen house and reaching underneath the hen to get the eggs, and sometimes the hen wouldn't like that, you know, you peck away at you. When you were a boy on the farm, did, uh, can you tell us what sort of animals you had? You mentioned you had chickens and milk cows. Cows. Horses. Oh, yes, yeah, we had horses. That's what we did all our work with. How many horses did you have? Oh, I suppose he had, probably had six, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, more than one team. Oh, yes, yeah. And the, the cows, the six cows that you had, did that produce enough milk for you to sell to a creamery? Yes, we uh, we did have electricity, so we'd uh, milk them by hand, and and it's water, at first the water was pumped by hand. We later did get a windmill that... Uh, when the wind blew, we didn't have to pump it. <laughs> so for our young listeners, the fact that you had no electricity means you had no lights at, at night. No lights, no. You didn't have television, you didn't have radio, you didn't have, uh, you know, 
and you didn't have uh, did you have you didn't have running water in, in the house I'm sure well, see we had running water in our house you had put that in but it was water from the sister to run off the roofs and into the sister and then we we had a pressure tank down the basement after we built a new house now because I don't remember anything about the old one okay anyway we'd have to when the pressure got low then we'd have to go down there and pump water from the sister into this pressure tank and it put pressure in there to push the water to the first story, no farther. Mm -hmm. And we would have a bathtub after the new house, which uh, not too many people had at that time. Mm -hmm. So when that came in 1938, electricity, our house was wired. So it was ready for the electricity. It was then, to then I suppose you started getting some of the conveniences that oh, electric electricity would run. Yes, we got the convenience. I remember my brother was, my oldest brother, he was pretty interested in having a radio. So we had a radio with a long antenna, you know, to another building from the house. So we had a radio early after we got electricity. Ernie, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of field equipment, uh, machinery that you had on the farm back in the early years? The machine had a two... I don't know what they call them, shoots coming into the dressing machine, so they could pitch in from both sides. So there were men there with pitchforks and throwing them? Yes, I suppose, uh, I never did it, uh, but I suppose my brothers did. And then uh, would have an engineer along to take care of the, the big... The big tractor, in a way, that pulled it. Yeah. And that tractor was not a gas tractor. No. Right? You're talking about a steam-driven tractor with fire. Yes. Uh, I don't remember what they called it. I used to know. I used to. It was fun to get up there, and sit on that thing, because it was. Uh, so it must have been quite a sight. You got smoke billowing out. You got a fire going in the heating the water in the boiler. Noise going on. Belts running. It must have been like a circus. But I think they come late in the later in the fall for us. It had these stacks, and it, maybe I was in school. I don't know, but I remember the they had an engineer that was in that tractor all the time, and I suppose he took care of the you know saw that everything on the treasury machine was working. I can't remember his name. But the guy he hired to, for engineer. We called him an engineer. <laughs> But it was always fun to get up in there, you know. Mm -hmm. It was something we didn't have. Was that typical of farmers? So the, the, the small, smaller farmers then hired out for jobs like that? Well, it was, when I remember, it was sort of coming to the end. And uh, then they'd have more smaller treasure machines around, and then they'd have what they called runs. They'd do for four or five different other farmers, and then they would haul it in on a hay rack and pitch it right into the treasure machine instead of putting it in a stack. But I do remember my uh, older brothers, when they made these stacks, they'd clear off a space from one end of the field to the other. So then my fourth oldest brother, he could start plowing, and he was quite young then with a single rope plow, so this that they cleaned off, and he could start their plowing. So they, with one bottom plow, you know, it would take, it would take some time. And then as he, as they would clean off further away, then he'd get a bigger spot to plow, plow on. And I think this was um, probably done just by our family because he had, had these boys that could do this work. Mm -hmm. But he went with a one bottom plow and three three horses. Got a lot of exercise. Uh, but he was the youngest, so he he was able to do that and he didn't have to do this loading up on the way rack and hauling it into this stack. And when you worked with horses, uh, how how long could a team of horses work? Well, I suppose they could work all day. Um, I don't remember 
Well, I don't remember using that many horses. I remember picking corn by hand, then I'd use horses. And I'd have to get the horses ready in the morning. And I also remember picking sweet corn, even sweet corn, a plant here in Montevideo. And uh, we'd have to pick it by hand. And uh, there'd be young people that come, they'd get a job picking sweet corn. I remember I had to, it was sort of my job to take care of the horses with the crew I, I was with. It was uh, one girl and one boy in that crew. And uh, be, be, seeing I was a nephew, I was honored to curry the horses in the evening, and take, the har well, take the harnesses off and, and curry them, feed them, and then harness them up again in the morning and poke them up to the wagon. And I remember the a girl that picked with us and a boy. A boy was left-handed, so he had to walk backwards because the girl and I were right-handed, so we weren't going to give that up. So he'd have to walk so he could throw with his left hand, and we would throw with our right. So you'd walk along the wagon, and there'd be a row of corn between you and the wagon, or you'd be picking and throwing into the wagon so you're walking along the wagon what's being pulled by the horse, right? Right. And there's, but is somebody driving that horse? No. No, no. he's just walking. In fact, that was uh, sort of my job, because he was my uncle, to uh, take care of the horse. And I can remember one time they didn't stop. They ran off. I could catch them. And it was on the way to that building site, so they ran around. And there was a driveway through the grove, and I ran after them and couldn't catch them. So I cut across into the grove, and just as I was coming into the yard, we're unloading the trailers that we picked into. They were unloading that by hand at that time into the truck that he was going to haul into Monty to the plant here in my video. Anyway, I was really thinking that he was going to chew me out for for uh, letting the horses go. And uh, he didn't say anything to me. He said, just get on. And he he made the horses run then to the, to the other end and then come back and up to where those two other kids were standing waiting for us. And after that, I never had any trouble with those horses. <laughs> they had gotten tired out running. He uh, used to range with a whip, strapped them, and, and away we went, all the way to the other end with sweet corn on the trailer already. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I do remember that they, after that, when I said, who, oh, they stopped <laughs> immediately. So, so horses were a little different. Uh, compared to tractors when it comes to behaving and doing what you want them to do. <laughs> they weren't always eager. <laughs> no, they were, took care. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, one of the things that I, I read was that uh, farmers who have lived through the era that you lived through say that it, was, it took more time and effort to take care of the animals than it did for the tractors, and that, therefore they had more time for actually farming the land. And that's one of the reasons why it's more efficient today. Oh, yes. It, uh, yeah, they were, took some care because you had to, they were a necessity. This is probably a question that's a little unfair, but I'm curious to know how long your equipment lasted. So if you bought a tractor, would it, would it be good for 10 years, 15 years? Well, depending on how much you used to, of course, but uh, I guess 10 years would be a, uh, Considered an old tractor by that time. Took two rolls of soybeans and didn't have a corn head, but it had an attachment where you, you uh, it had a pickup attachment where there was a belt that fed into the feeder. And we'd first swat our grain, put it in swats, and then it would pick up those swats. So it was used for soybeans and small grain. Well, at that time there was. Uh, there was no self-propelled combines. I do remember that in 1957 it was really wet. We had a terrible time to, 
to uh, get our crop out because I think I finished bead combine in 3rd of December. Mm. And I remember that because it was my daughter's birthday. <laughs> and I hauled in my last soybeans, 3rd of December. We hadn't picked corn yet. We oh, hadn't picked the corn? We hadn't picked corn yet because it was so wet we couldn't drive them. And at that time we hadn't had any, we hadn't gotten any drainage on our land, so it was a horrible time. Because at that time we were picking with two row corn pickers. Ernie, we know that the government has been involved with farming for a long, long time and that those government policies and practices have changed and those changes affect how farms are farmed. Can you talk about that a little bit? Early on when I was farming, we would seal our grain. The government would pay us some more dollar for our corn and seal it and, we'd, and then we'd have a chance to through the till spring to probably sell it on the market if the market went up. And if it didn't, then you, you'd be guaranteed that dollar twenty or what? I don't think it went any higher than dollar twenty. And you, you would, and and if you wanted to, then you could put up more bins, and you would get interest at a cheap rate for building new bins. If you wanted to reseal it, then you'd get twenty five, twenty eight cents more for the next year. That you'd have the same grain you could sell for, you know, on the market if mm -hmm. the market went up. If it didn't, you held it till they called it in, and so it ended up that the, our government was sitting on a huge amount of corn reserve, corn reserve they called it. Other countries wanted our corn, and it was up to our government to sell it to them, and I, we, the farmers didn't think we're selling it fast enough. And I remember one of our presidents saying, we're going to export our farmers and keep our grain. <laughs> that was not popular with me, because I remember thinking that if they had a blockade to the White House, food blockade, I was going to be there. <laughs> it never happened. <laughs> I don't want to get into politics. <laughs> We have just heard from a Montevideo farmer who started farming as a child in the 1930s and continued farming for eight decades. We thank Mr. Arnie Knuckleby for his considerable time and effort in sharing his experiences. He spoke about farming as he lived it. Now you, you should think back about his story, look at your notes, and create a list of the major changes you heard Mr. Knuckleby talk about. Then write a one paragraph summary of those changes. Save that list and summary because in the next podcast, you will learn from a current farmer about major changes today in farming methods. You will be able to compare and contrast, which means to see what is similar and what is different, between farming methods from long ago and those from today. You have been listening to a production of the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. Background music is courtesy of Jim Hogue of Decorah, Iowa. Images and sounds from the internet have clickable credit links if your device allows for that interaction. The Minnesota Alliance is a nonprofit group of volunteer educators who work to promote an enhanced understanding of our world through improved geographic literacy. Ah!